the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission's Dinosaur Park. Well, or just the Maryland on. Dinosaur Park, if you're- Maryland Dinosaur Park. Raise your hand if you've been to the Dinosaur Park. Thank you. All right, you gotta go. First and third sun Saturdays, you can go and help dig for dinosaur bones in that. Yes, there were dinosaurs in Maryland. Behind JP, there are some dinosaur footprints that were found in Western Maryland right there. Um, they were part of a convent and they were discovered the nuns would be walking to and from chapel on top of dinosaur feet. And they were found in the 1800s and they have pieces of them in different natural history collections um, throughout the state, but we're lucky to have one here. And today, JP is going to talk to us about the American cheetah. And we'll learn what cheetah means uh, in just a second. So I'll turn this over to you. And thank you again. Let's see, we got this right. Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, thank you for all coming out this afternoon. Um, again, my name is J.P. Hodnett. I am the paleontologist with the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission's Dinosaur Park. Um, she did say we, were, we have programs every first and first Saturday, which is true, including next Saturday is our next program, totally free to the public, uh, starting from uh, 12 uh, p.m. We run to about 4 o'clock. Um, one little caveat, we do kind of stop taking people in at 3.30, so try to be there before 3.30. Um, but it is an excellent place if you guys are interested in dinosaurs, come learn about our local uh, dinosaur heritage uh, in the state of Maryland. They have some fantastic stuff going back 115 million years, all pre-T-Rex type dinosaurs there. So um, the other part of my job and career is that I also work part-time at the National Park Service. So I also get a chance to go all over the country and learn about the, the amazing uh, fossil heritage. And that's actually what we do as part of the National Fossil Day. We celebrate our American fossil heritage all across the country. So there are events going on all across the, uh, the uh, country starting this weekend and going on to the next weekend. And some people will have stuff going beyond that. Um, for those of you who have free time and are able to get out to the Smithsonian National History Museum this Wednesday, which is the official National Fossil Day day, um, I will be there with along with uh, some of my colleagues from the National Park Service talking about the National Park Service uh, paleontology program and uh, you know, being amongst all some of the most fantastic fossils you've ever seen in the world at the Smithsonian. So if you guys are available, please come on out and check us out from 10 to 2 uh, at the fossil hall in, at the Smithsonian. Anyway, um, so like I said, I, I work with the National Park Service. And what I'm presenting with you today is part of that piece of research that I did for the National Park Service. It was also part of my undergraduate uh, education um, when I was an undergrad student at Northern Arizona University many, many moons ago. <laughs> so, but anyway, so yes, I would like to talk to you about one of my favorite topics. Now, some people who do know me, I work also on sharks, really old sharks. Um, but very few people know from, from here that I also work on fossil cats. Um, growing up in Arizona, most of my colleagues knew that I work on cats. They hardly now know I work on sharks. So anyway, um, but yes, let me tell you about one of my most favorite ancient cats, which is known as Mirasanonic or what is called the quote unquote American cheetah. Yeah, here we can move this forward. There we go. All right, so we're going to start off with the current cat family tree. Um, one here. Well, I'm going to show you right now is that, uh, so this is the branch of all known living cats to this day. And when they, their uh, specific branches start to branch off millions of years ago, what is not shown here is the branch that includes saber tooth cats, things like Smilodon, Homotherium, some other weird little cats you probably never heard called like Dinophilus or Adelphalurus, things like that. Um, this is all the cats that we have alive today. There's a major branch called the Panthera ancestor group or the Pantherini. Those are all the roaring long-faced cats. So that's like they're lions, tigers, leopards of all different varieties. And then the rest of the branch is all the short-faced purring cats, the filini. But there's only side branches that um, have specific groups of cats that relate to them, like the lynx family, the uh, bay cat family, which is a bunch of Asian type cats, um, things like caracals. Um, the group that I'm really interested in is what's known as the puma family. The Puma family actually includes a number of really cool cats in my opinion. 
There's three of them that are alive today. There's the Jagarundi, which a lot of people really do not know much about. It's a small cat, very, pre it's, it's literal scientific name is Herpalurus, the creeping cat. So that says a lot about its uh, natural history. This is a cat that lives on their brush, usually found in South Africa, uh, sorry, South America, Central America, and just in the lower southern part of Western uh, North America, like around Texas and New Mexico. Um, and this is a very dark colored cat, but it's a very fun looking little feline, it has a very long face. The reason why I'm so excited about it is I used to be a volunteer at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum in Tucson, and they had one alive there, so I would have, ever on my break, I'd go talk to them about everything. Um, but there's also the mountain lion, or the puma. So the puma is a very iconic American cat. Now this cat actually does have a wide distribution across all the Americas. So you find it as far south as Patagonia, in South America and as far north as like the Canadian Arctic or at least in the Canadian mountain ranges there. And then you of course you have the Chia, which is on the other side of the world. It's in Africa as far as we know of it, but also occurs in Asia. There's actually a, a subspecies uh, called the Asiatic Chia, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But what we know is the Chia is the African Chia. It's cats that live in great plains of uh, Africa, hunting fast game like uh, antelopes and uh, other swift-footed ungulates. Um, but these all have an ancestor. One of these ancestral cats is called Puma lacustris. I'm going to put Puma in quotations, uh, largely because uh, looking at the anatomy of these things, they kind of are more primitive. They probably deserve its own name. Originally, it was called Felis lacustris when it was first described back in the 1930s. But Felis was just kind of a catch-all name used by a lot of zoologists that during that time to describe all cats. But um, we have a number of parts of it now. We have the, the tie specimen is a jaw, uh, which I have actually a cast up on my table if you want to check out the carnivores. Um, but we now have more complete skeletons, including a really nice skull from Arizona, which I'm hoping at some point to, uh, to be able to study. And this is a small cat. So this is a little bit bigger than a house cat, um, probably about the size of maybe like a, a lynx or, or a caracal. But uh, going further back in time, we have some larger forms of pumas that actually do not live in the Americas. These are things come like uh, Puma paradoides and uh, Verilur schwabi. Now, Verilur schwabi is not considered part of uh, Puma paradoides, but these are European mountain lions. So these cats actually evolved in America and then able to redistribute back into Europe. And so they were quite large. Um, Thing correctly about cheetahs. So cheetahs have been around for quite a while. Um, some of the oldest cheetahs go back about four million years, and they are huge. These are like lion-sized cheetahs. Uh, the specific species is called the Asinonyx parthenensis. Um, it's found largely throughout much of Europe and then parts of Asia, and they were gigantic. I mean, they were lion-sized cheetahs, and they were hunting down big, ungulate, swift-moving prey, um, kind of like giant antelopes and things like that. Um, as to like when cheetahs started to get big, we're not quite sure. The, the early fossil evidence of really early true cheetahs is very spotty, which is a common reason why we get into the story of American cheetah. Um, but this is a cat that's, uh, I would say almost iconic for the Pleistocene and Pliocene of North America. Uh, this is one of the biggest cats that lived in North America um, during the Pliocene to the Pleistocene. And the name Mirasinonix means wonderful cheetah. It's a fantastic name um, and because it is kind of a wonderful looking animal. Um, and when the first people who were looking at these animals and kind of deciding, you know, let's call it the American cheetah, they thought that this animal was the ancestor to all cheetahs that are now found in Africa and Asia. Um, talking about the distribution of these cats, uh, they are found across all of North America. So we actually have found fossils from them in California, all the way to Florida, also here in Maryland. Um, in North America, they have a wide distribution going up at least as far up as, as Northern Wyoming and Southern Montana. And they've been found, fossils have been found of this animal going as far south as least the Southern portions of Northern Mexico, or maybe the most Northern parts of Central Mexico, depending on how you talk to. Um, temporally, in terms of age, we find fossils been going back to the early Pliocene, roughly 4.5 million years ago. And then they went extinct just approximately 10,000 years ago, about the same time a lot of the large Pliocene megafauna went extinct as well. So why is it called the American cheetah? Well, we'll start with the, the, the cranium. 
So in my hand, I have a plaster cast of a specimen of Mirasonomics, the, the American Jew. This skull was collected uh, actually from Santa Clara, California. It's actually one of the older representations of this genus. So key character traits, one, it has a very domed head. It has a very cheetah-like trait. Most cheetahs have really dome-shaped uh, crania with shortened faces. And because their faces get shortened, their teeth get more compact and close together. Uh, one of the key traits also we'll, we'll point out which is this, what's called the second premolar. It's tightly uh, closely associated with the canine and what's also known as the premolar. Um, in terms of their jaws, because again, their skulls are shortened, there's a very short gap between the lower canine and the next tooth next to it. Um, and things like mountain lions and uh, like pantherine cats, that gap is really wide. <laughs> In terms of everything behind the skull, the skeleton behind the skull or the postcranial skeleton, it is also very cheetah like. They have very long, gracile limbs, so basically long, skinny limbs. Um, their bones are not heavily structured to hold massive muscles like a mountain lion. So, when you look at a cheetah fossil, uh, we find what we call the, the muscle insertion sites. They are not heavily scarred, as we would call it anatomically. So, it's suggesting that. Um, those muscles are not massive, they're not made for gripping and holding uh, large struggling prey. These are more for like quick movement, uh, running motions. Um, there's also some, some weird other details. So um, in my hand here, I have the ankle bone and uh, it turns out cat ankle bones are very distinctive. Um, there's some extra joints and things like that in marastonotics that you do not see in mountain lions or even uh, African cheetahs. So that's a very distinct trait. But unlike uh, African cheetahs, um, the, the claws of Mirasthenonics are retractable. African cheetahs do not retract their claws when they're running. Uh, they use those claws as kind of like cleats of, like, for runners, and they use those to kind of grip the ground as they're running straight out as part of the prey. Now, this is where it gets a little more interesting. So recently, somebody actually was able to extract DNA from cheetah fossils, or sorry, Mirasonic fossils from a site in Wyoming. And they actually produce enough genetic material to compare it with living cats. And it turns out that even though that the Mirasonic, very cheetah-like animal, is more closely related to the living mountain lion than it is to the African cheetah or even the jaguarundi. So what this really will tell us is that the origins of Mirasonic was probably closer to the common ancestor with the mountain lion versus the same like the cheetah or the jaguarundi. So let's talk about some of the early uh, Mirasonic fossils, different groups. There's at least two species. The first one should be near and dear to us. This is an animal called Mirasonic and is pectatus. It's the very first of the uh, recognized uh, American cheetah fossils that were originally described in 1895 by uh, E.D. Cope. So for, for those of you who don't know, Cope was very famous for having a rivalry with another paleontologist called O.C. Marsh from Yale University. And they named some of the most famous dinosaurs that we have ever recognized. Names like Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Camarasaurus. Who's heard of those names? Okay, so you have, excellent, yeah. So these two gentlemen, you know, they were always trying to outdo each other, naming the most fossils as they can. Um, it turns out E.D. Cope probably won that battle. He named a lot of different things, including the very first uh, uh, American cheetah fossil. But the fun thing is, is that he didn't recognize it first as being a cat. He originally thought the fossils he was looking at were actually from a hyena. And that was kind of like a big deal at the time because nobody thought hyenas lived in North America. He was later proven wrong that his fossil was a cat, but later we did find hyena fossils near the Grand Canyon. So hyenas did at one point actually live in North America for a short time. Um, his fossils were from Port Kennedy Cave uh, in Pennsylvania, and mostly it was just a few you know, jaw fragments and, and uh, other associated bones um, that were very mountain lion-like to most people who studied cats at the time. Um, there are early fossils like the skull I was showing you that roughly begin of another name called Mirasonic Studeri. So some paleontologists have this, the, have the idea that anything from 
the lower pliocene would probably be designated as uh, Mirasonic studeri. Um, and we most of the fossils we get of Mirasonic in expectatus um, comes from cave and valley uh, fossil deposits. So here is our Maryland representation of Mirasonic and expectatus. These are coming from Cumberland Bone Cave. Anybody who ever heard of Cumberland Bone Cave? Some of you have. Um, this site is actually very close to Cumberland, Maryland. Um, it originally was part of a railroad construction project that cut through basically unbeknownst in a cave chamber. And there were essentially fossils in the cave floor beds that got exposed rapidly to the air. And during the early 1910s, um, members of the Smithsonian Institution were made aware of these fossil deposits and came in and ex extracted these fossils for over a number of years. Um, and then later excavations were occurring back in the 1950s and 60s. But what they found were basically a lower jaw and some upper teeth and a few limb bones, but they all were referred to as Mirasonics and Spectatus. Later in the 1980s, in Hamilton Cave in West Virginia, they found a more complete skeleton, which includes more of a skull, a lot more of the postcranial skeleton, especially the upper arms, and a good portion of the backbone. And this actually would kind of gave more emphasis on like, well, are these really cheetahs or are these more like um, a puma relative? And then very recently, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this, this is Petra. So well, I personally have not seen this specimen but the, the Virginia Museum of Natural History has excavated a new, a new cave site where they have this completely articulated large cat. Um, so far from, well, at least judging from their website, they're seeing this cat uh, a little bit younger than uh, 12,000 years old. Um, but there's some question whether it's mountain lion or is it, you know, Mirasonics with American cheetah. Um, judging from the age, I would argue strongly that it is Mirasonics. Um, beginning into, uh, younger Mirasonic fossils, there's Mirasonic's Trumani. Now, Trumani is important because this is the animal that's usually largely associated with the idea that the cheetah like cats help influence the evolution of pronghorns. So we got a pronghorn in the back corner there. These are some of the fastest animals that are alive today in North America. Um, this was originally from a uh, name from a partial skeleton uh, found in a cave site in uh, Nevada in 1969. Um, they are larger than mountain lions, Mirasonics from night, but they're not as heavy as Mirasonics and Expectatus, the older animal. And we do know their fossils occur from the Florida to California. Uh, and we usually where we find their fossils are using cave sites and tar seeps, so things like La Brea. So here's the type specimen of Mirasonics trimini. And again, it was just a beautiful skull with lower jaws, but only the front part of the skeleton. So there's nothing else besides a shoulder girdle and a few vertebra. The one of the cave sites that actually gave us the best data for Marisonics was a site called Natural Track Cave. And it was at this site that back in the 1960s and 70s that were used, these fossils were used to argue that uh, Marisonics was the ancestor to all American cheetahs before they had genetic evidence to suggest otherwise. Um, this is basically this cave site is, is, is a pitfall trap. So there's only a large high opening. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's a very far drop. All these little specks here are people. <laughs> so it's a huge opening. And the cartoon on, in the lower uh, corner there is suggesting, it's kind of giving the idea that things are either running and just kind of falling in the cave um, and piling up in these massive bodies. Um, however, more work has been done in terms of the stratigraphy of these sites. And it's not massive piles of bodies. Things are actually falling in, getting injured, and wandering around and dying on, on the edges of the cave. So, um, but they have found in this site, not only Miras and Onyx, but they also found American lion, Beringian wolves, um, mammoths, pronghorns, bighorn sheep, shrubots. So there's a whole assortment of Pleistocene animals in this cave. Um, I say pronghorns, uh, which is kind of like the idea that, oh yeah, these, these American cheetahs are chasing pronghorns, making them faster as, as time goes on. Um, they're not the most common animal you find at Natural Track Cave. It's actually bighorn sheep. And that's an important thing to remember as I go further on in my discussion here. But um, I'm gonna bring up La Brea. 
uh, La Brea and uh, Kittrex, California, these are tar seeds. So these are the classic, you know, tar pits. Animals getting stuck into these uh, sticky traps and dying, and then getting covered over with uh, uh, essentially asphalt. Um, there was a fossil cat named in 1916 called Felis de Gedei, well before uh, Marasonix trumani was even named in 1969. Um, there was a jaw that was found in La Brea, and then a near complete skull that was found in McKittrick. And what's cool about these fossils is that they have all the characteristics of what we consider American cheetah. But to this day, they're still classified as being mountain lion. But some of the pictures I've shown you, I mean, look at the skull. It is well done. It's very cheetah-like. Short in the face. The teeth are all compact together. I mean, I look at this and going, this is mere astronomics. I think somebody needs to do a new research paper and reclassify these things. So anybody want a project? I got an idea for you. <laughs> Now, going to the Pleistocene, Miracinonyx is an important large predator for the late Pleistocene and a uh, large part of the um, So these also include things like giant short-faced bears, American lions, dire wolves, and of course, favorite to cat, like Smilodon. Um, and as a self-promotion, I have all of these cat, uh, animals on our table in the next room over if you want to check them out. Um, but what are American cheetahs eating? Well, if you go back to the Pliocene and early Pliocene, they're probably hunting things like primitive members of the pronghorn family, um, early llamas, um, peccaries, things like that. Things that are not considered super fast, um, but they may have been influenced being faster as these things are hunting them. And where we find most of these uh, uh, American cheetah fossils, they are found in valley sites and in caves. So we do find in some cave sites, you'll find lots of evidence of peccaries, um, but you won't find many pronghorns. Um, but llamas are kind of more on the valley thing, uh, valley deposits of well, so Bolivian lowlands rather than highlands. But in the late Pleistocene, there are also other large mammals. So you have large mammals. You have, of course, again, pronghorns, you have deer, uh, horses, bison, um, but if you go out southwest, and this is also getting to go play uh, in an important role now, um, you also have things that have like mountain goats and, and bighorn sheep. And this actually brings me to my research. So it turns out that this American cheetah, which again, a long while has been classified as these animals that are specialized living in open habitats, much like an African cheetah, um, you know, they need those kind of environments to survive. That's the ecological model that was placed on them. But we found American cheetah fossils in the Grand Canyon, which is nothing like the environment I just described. You know, these are highland uh, areas, lots of steep slopes, dry habitats. So what's going on here? Well, let's start with some of the evidence. One of the best places that we found uh, these uh, large cat fossils was a site called Grand Parquet, which is located on the very northwest uh, edge of the Grand Canyon, right near, not too far from Lake Mead. What's famous about Grand Park Cave is not necessarily the cat fossils, but it was actually that it was a cave site that was full of sloth dump. It was just piles and piles upon uh, sloth poop, and they even found a sloth skeleton inside the cave. So there's actually a couple distinct layers. There's a lower layer that's just full of sloths. Then there's a small layer that had nothing. But, but it had a lot of other animal bones. And then on top of that, there was a soft uh, dung layer. So we're thinking that thin air ball was actually where we're finding uh, a lot of these, these American large cat fossils um, was the zone when the cat lived in the cave, rather the sloth using it as a latrine. So a little quick history about Rampart Cave. It was originally uh, identified back in the early 1930s. And it was actually part of a civilian corpse uh, conservation program, so the CCC, back during the, uh, uh, the Great Depression, was used uh, this site to send people into and help excavate this cave. And then another excavation took place by the Smithsonian in the 1940s. And so they actually drew a map. So the, the gray areas there is actually the little troughs they actually dug within the cave floor. And then I have indicated, based on their records, where the cat fossils occurred. And there were two individuals and lots and lots of poop in this cave. So here are the fossils. It's actually kind of exciting. So the blue skull is the subadult. So it's about the size, actually it's greater in size to a, a modern mountain lion, but it's against a younger animal. The teeth haven't quite fully erupted yet, but they're all the, they're all the adult teeth now. 
And then the other individual on the, on the right there in the red skull, um, that is a juvenile, it's six months old, but its fossils are larger than an adult mountain lion. So that's kind of a, a telltale sign. Uh, and all these fossils were originally described in the 1940s as being mountain lion fossils. But like I was talking before, so we're to use the subadult skull, the all the teeth are very closely compact, including that little second premolar is right, uh, you know, wedged right in between the canine and the other larger third premolar. Um, the limb bones are, are also kind of gracile, not having a lot of muscle, heavy muscle, uh, muscle scarring. And uh, this basically told us that, yeah, these are Marinas and Onyx fossils. The other thing is that really exciting about some of these fossils, there's actually flesh, there's actually partially mummification on the skull. So in some of the, the palate and the gums are still attached to the skull. And then with the, the young juvenile, which we just call the kitten, you look really closely right here, that is part of the toe pad and the, foot, and the skin around the claw and the claw is actually still attached too. So a lot of these fossils are still having uh, ligaments and tendons and things like that still attached to the skeleton due to the dry conditions of the cave. So that was kind of like very strong evidence of these cats occurring here. Um, and of course, there was lots and lots of poop. This is my crappy photo of of the uh, Marasonic from the Garden of Our Cave. <laughs> Bad joke, but, uh, but a lot of these had fragments of uh, large animal bones um, inside the poop, a lot of uh, hair that did not belong to the cat, and they were scattered throughout. Uh, largely the opening or towards the opening of the cave. And in the monks, all this other stuff were other animals. There were remains of uh, uh, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, small stilted lake deer, or sorry, not deer, uh, 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 horses, um, even some large rodents were all amongst all the remains that were this small interval that were probably this, this was used as a denning site. And then we found other fossils within the Grand Canyon. So this is an ankle bone or the calcanium and uh, measuring it, it fits right within the parameters for Marasonomics, specifically the Marasonomics trubinite species, the late Pleistocene uh, American cheetah. Um, and then on the far right there, it's another set of toe bones um, that are from this cat. One of them still had a claw attached. And um, what we think is happening here is that these were bones are brought in by things like pack rats or uh, an animal called a ring-tailed cat, which is actually a relative of a raccoon. Now, what that tells us is that these animals will forage out and bring in uh, uh, bones and things like that to their nest, but not very far away. So somewhere back, you know, maybe, you know, 14,000 years or so, there was a body of a Marasonyx in the Grand Canyon and some little mammal took toes away and brought it back to its nest. So that's the evidence there. So these things were living in the canyon. And when also they were living and they were dying in the Grand Canyon. So there's evidence in the subadult skeleton from Rampart Cage that it died from a fight from another Marasonyx. And this is not uncommon for large cats, especially like there's evidence of the uh, confrontations with the uh, mountain lions um, that in the uh, specific parts of the skeleton, on the skull and the jaw, and then the vertebrae, there are bite marks, crushing bite marks, especially in the spine, that probably would have been fatal to uh, the subadult here. So something happened um, at least 35,000 years ago, so that's how what we, these fossils are, are age date too, um, that led to the death of this animal. We don't know why. Uh, there could have been a fight over the young cat that may have been either killed or being defended against. Um, it could have been a territorial thing. We're not sure. Um, one of the things I'm hoping to do in the future, and we're, I'm discussing this with some other colleagues of mine, is to take, see if we can get genetic information from both individuals from Rampart Cave. And one of the big things I want to find out, were they related? So if they were related, Maybe it's a mother and a child that unfortunately something happened and they both died in this cave. Or maybe it's a, a stranger and a, another young cat that had nothing to do with each other. Um, but we won't know until we get that information. But going back to one of the more critical things is like, what is a cat or a chicken like cat doing in the Grand Canyon? Because like I mentioned before, historically, Miriam and Onyx 
with always this kind of thought is that being a definitely an age field like animal, whether it be homologous, is, that is the evolution that the, these were the early cheetahs, then they evolved to chase uh, fast moving prey like a pronghorn, or analogous, like this convergent evolution with a slightly different lineage. Um, but there was the idea again that you know, you have a cheetah like cat, it has to live in a savanna like habitat um, and hunting swift prey. But uh, the problem is, is that. That's not the case with the Grand Canyon fossils. You know, we are not even close to an open habitat like that. So we needed a new model. And one of the, one, the first ones I thought of, well, what about the snow leopard? Surprisingly, when we think of snow leopards, when we see documentaries, you're looking at this huge fluffy cat. Um, not thinking that underneath all of that fluff is actually a very long gray style skeleton, very much cheetah-like, even though this is an animal that's more related to lions and tigers, um, and even, even the snow leopard skull is more dome-like compared to its other relatives, like the tiger and lion. Um, and these things are well adapted to be, one, fast. They can run up vertical uh, hills and, and uh, canyon lands quite swiftly, much like a cheetah does on a horizontal surface. And they can chase things like goats and uh, sheep across these uh, types of environments and are very successful hunters. Um, so that was one model I proposed and uh, got some good responses from my colleagues. But in terms of my research, I was looking at another kind of cheetah. Very few people know that there's a, a thing called the Asiatic, Asiatic cheetah. Now, a show of hands. Is this your first time you ever heard about the Asiatic cheetah? Most of you. All right. So yeah, so the cheetah, uh, Asinonis jubatus, had a long distribution historically. It wasn't just confined to Africa. They used to actually live in places like India, um, Saudi Arabia, and part of the Caspian area, um, basically in the Middle East. There's only a single population alive today in Iran. And they're doing their very best to try to conserve what's left of what's this population. But the Asiatic cheetah is kind of fitting what we're thinking about what's going on, at least with the Grand Canyon cat population. These things live in high uh, elevation, desert-like environments with canyons and high uh, plateaus. And they're hunting things like sheep, goats, which we have at the Rampart Cave. But they are also hunting things like our antelope-like animals. So things like are kind of like pronghorns, um, which is the, our, Amer our American analog. Um, they are still hunting those kind of animals too. So it's probably what's happening is that Mirasononic has more of an Asiatic cheetah like habitat or, or uh, ecology and is able to hunt a variety of different things. Not only is an open grasslands hunter, but also uh, in vertical canyon spaces. So it can go horizontally and vertically fast. Um, and then very recently within like the last few months, it was an isotopic uh, analysis that suggested that looking at the bones from Na uh, Natural Trap Cave, those cheetahs were hunting things like pronghorns, but it wasn't the primary uh, food source for them. So there's a, a good kind of combination of that. Yeah, Mirasan Rice was basically kind of like the Swiss army knife of the cat family during the Pleistocene. It could pretty much do a lot of different things, except for maybe tackling a, a mammoth. I don't think that would happen, but um, anyway. But uh, getting to the story of the extinction, why do we do not have Mirasanonics to this day? And the reason being is that it also went extinct during the last, uh, the end of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. So it, it died off same time with like the American lion, the saber toothed cat, giant short faced bears, things like that. Um, approximately about the same time this animal started to go extinct, this is when the North, what we consider the North American mountain lion, came from South America into, back into North America. So for the longest time, there was a question like, well, did mountain lions and Miras and Onyx live together? And the short answer is no. It turns out that the ancestor of, it seems like the ancestor of both Miras and Onyx and mountain lions split. One when the, the Panamanian Isthmus connected, one population went south, and that even later evolved into basically the, what we now consider the modern mountain lion or puma lineage. They started in South America and then re-immigrated back into North America and took over just as the Miras and Onyx, the American cheetah, was just starting to go extinct. So it wasn't, we're not quite sure whether it was the mountain lion coming in to help kind of force the Miras and Onyx to go extinct, um, but they do coincide. 
And afterwards of that, the mountain lion and the jaguar became the top feline predators of all the Americas. And that I'm going to conclude. So, any questions, anybody? <laughs> when I think of the cheetah, I think of spots. Do we know that the American cheetah had spots? We're not 100% sure whether they had spots. Um, if we actually look at the coat of a young mountain lion, so I got one right here. Um, this is my little stuffed animal here. This is a uh, mountain lion cub. They are born with spots similar to a cheetah. So there is a, a kind of a thought evolutionary process that when you see the coats of young cats, those are maybe in the primitive condition. And as they mature, their coloration will change. So it's possible that things like Marisonics could have been spotted similar to uh, African cheetahs today, but maybe not quite exactly. Okay. Yes. When you look at uh, some of like National Geographic shows or something, they show that uh, like African cheetah can run like upwards of 60, 70 miles an hour in short bursts. Mm -hmm. Now these giant cheetahs, has anybody ever estimated like could they go 80 or 85 miles an hour? <laughs> yes. you know, yeah, soup up the engine, right? You need to go faster. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't think it quite works that way. Um, so you're talking about the, the, the Eurasian giant cheetahs. What's probably happening is that these cats are adapted to, because back at the time, those ungulates, those antelope-like animals, were larger. So they were probably just being more adapted to the, the, uh, keeping up with these larger animals. It may not be faster, but at least strong enough to hunt those kind of larger antelope animals. In terms of the Mirasinonics, I don't think it probably reached that exact kind of speed we see in them, uh, exactly like American cheetahs because they don't retract their claws. I mean, well, I'm sorry, they do retract their claws. They didn't, probably weren't using the cleat motion that African cheetahs need to make those sharp turns and running. So my guess is, is that they probably could run fast, but not as fast. And it probably were probably better as ambush predators versus like straight out running after your prey. Uh, type animals. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Not yet. We're getting a time machine to really be sure. So, um, yes, yes, sir. Did the, were the caves mostly near the rim of the canyon or all? Most of them are from the rim. Yeah. So, so wouldn't the cats have just gone up to the surface and touch them? That is also uh, very much likely the possibility. But you still have to have get them back into the cave. So they either are eating their prey and then going back to their house in the cave. Or they also are probably living in within the cave canyon itself. Um, National Trap Cave is in Wyoming. It is a high plateau area, so it's not exactly a savanna, even from the the Pleistocene vegetation standard that we think of. So it's not like California, where almost like these like you know Mediterranean environments. Um, it's high desert. It's, there's you know grasses and pinions and things like that. So there's a lot of rocky conditions that these cats are found in. Especially thinking about the inexpectata species that we find here on the East Coast. Where are we finding them? We're finding them in caves like Cumberland Cave. You guys been through Cumberland, I, I take it. How many of you have been to Cumberland? Is that flat? No, <laughs> it's very much karst, karst, uh, habitats. So these cats had been adapted even early on to live in those um, canyon karst, you know, high country uh, habitats. So, yes. Um. I know that there were cedar trees and um, other large cat predator species at the time. Were there any predator species that came in direct contact or competition before the extinction of the United States? I would say yes, actually. Because, um, you know, these are all specialized predators. So they're all, they all have a special, we call it niches. Um, but sometimes those niches will overlap. So I can see now one of the things that you actually look into about being a, uh, having a cheetah-like ecology, cheetahs are actually highly successful in terms of catching their prey. So if you look into the numbers, so this is getting to some statistics, um, cheetahs are basically 50% successful in every hunt they make. So, you know, one out of two, they always catch something. For a lion or a tiger or something like that, the number is actually lower. So to be built like a cheetah, it's, it's actually considered a good thing. Uh, whatever some whatever the reason for nature's uh, laws are for that, but for whatever reason, cheetahs are very successful. So it's not uncommon. Again, this is also why sometimes we have to be careful how we use you know living models. But there are predators that keep an eye on cheetahs 
and seeing what they're hunting and if they're successful. And if they are successful, those predators like lions will come in and steal the prey of the cheetah that is a hard, you know, hard one for, you know. So the sort of klepto predators essentially. Uh, so yes, there is uh, evidence still today about that. And then whether there's competition of other predators uh, interacting with each other, um, I want to say yes, or some evidence of, you know, things attacking other things that are not related. But there's also a lot of evidence of other big cats fighting other big cats. So there's evidence of saber tooth cats like Smilodon fighting other Smilodon. There's actually a, a fantastic specimen. There is a saber tooth canine that punctured the skull of another saber tooth during some sort of combat. And I'm thinking like, ouch. <laughs> so, um, so I hope that answers your question. Any others? Yes. It was that a limestone cave, right? The trap cave. The natural trap cave? No. I'm trying to remember my geology. I want to say yes. That's actually what opened up the sinkhole and made the drop. Because um, it is a it is a something that actually collapsed and opened this opening. And it's a very deep drop. There is so they, from what I've been reading and some uh, conversations I had with my colleagues who are working natural trap cave now, um, there's some suggestions that these things fell and the fall did not kill them. So they are in this cave trapped and they died basically from starvation and, and exposure. So um, that's also the, the reason why they're, there's not this pyramid of bodies uh, at the cave as well. So, um, so that would have to be underwater way back. Probably at some point, yes. But when these things were, were occurring, it wasn't a water. No, it's no, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, with all the uh, cats and everything that were in the cave and the animals that got uh, trapped in there as they were starting to starve, I guess it was kind of like cannibalism going on, eating each other up. I mean, is there more evidence of some of the bones that being gnawed on? Yeah. I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I don't think I've seen anything that said, suggested that. Um, because they're suggesting that what's happening in natural track cave is just over periods of time that things are falling in. So it's not like all at once. It's all like, you know, you know, one month something died and fell in, and then the next month maybe something died and fell in, or fell in and died, et cetera. Um, that sort of scenario. So probably not a great, you know, place to go or or not sustaining it. Like if the animal fell in on okay, there's this fire, I mean, be off of that for a couple of months. No, I don't think it's quite like that. Okay, guys, well, thank you for your time and uh, coming out today. There's a short hair cat, uh, uh, a domestic cat, too. Yes. So that's it. Hey. 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 Hey.